Uh, my name is Willem van Genucht, and I'm the president of the Royal Netherlands Society of International Law. And it's my privilege to say welcome to all of you, also on behalf of Nico Schrijver. I don't know where Nico is. President of the Institute. This is a jointly organized, whatever you call it, symposium, mini symposium, seminar. The words are up to you. Some of you will remember the following words. The first one now will later be last for the times they are changing. On Tuesday, we discussed the relation between world politics and international law, and we focused on specific leaders, some of, more, some of them more blonde than others, and we asked ourselves the question, uh, how, do, how does the world look like these days? How can we do justice to the underprivileged? Uh, back and forth and time and again raised question. And how to use international law in that regard? And you will have, or you will remember, I think, that the words, the first line, that they do come from Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan said that the occasion of receiving the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature, that I had, I is he, I had principles, sensibilities, and an informed view of the world. And when reading these words, principles, sensibilities, and an informed view of the world, I thought this is a nice combination that is also applicable to Arthur Heifinger. If you read principles like knowledge of international law, if you read sensibilities as having an open eye for what's happening in the world, and if you read informed view on the world as being aware of what's happening and, and gathering a lot of knowledge, then I think this is synonymous for Arthur Eivinger. It's only my task to give him the floor, and I will do so in a few minutes. Uh, Arthur, um, he will be praised, I think, afterwards. I'm not sure, Dan, by Dan Asser. Um, so I can leave it at that at this very moment. But before giving him the floor, I would like to thank Nauta Dutil, the law firm. Um, they expressed their enormous appreciation for the work of Tobias Osser by offering you the coffee and the drinks at the very beginning of this evening. And I can already mention by now, and this is not related to Nauta Dutil, that there will be no drinks afterwards. <laughs> so eight o'clock is more or less eight o'clock in the evening. But thanks to um, not a detail, we could offer you this. And I think I can also speak on behalf of Nico Schrijver, ED president, uh, that we very much appreciate this gesture by this great law firm. Later on, we will have a panel. The panel will be chaired by Hans van Loon, and I will shortly introduce him uh, in about half an hour or a bit more from now. The floor now first goes to Arthur Eiviger for his presentation about work, life, theory, practice, I don't know, of Tobias Asser, whatever I like. Thank you very much. That might be a good idea. Does this microphone function? Yes? Good to hear. Thank you, William, for these kind and welcome words. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Tobias Asser was a consummate lawyer, no question about it. But the same holds good for more family members before and after him. As it is, the Netherlands have never been gone short of the particular variety of the human species to a nation that is positioned in the eye of the storm of Europe, wedged in between conflicting great powers with interests of their own, with no political influence whatsoever, with no military strength, but we're treasuring an economic, economic interest worldwide, the law has always been a ready proposition. And the comparative study of conflicting law propositions, as in the civil and common law traditions, has only come to natural. 
then why is it that the most subtle of diplomats in the Netherlands at about 1900, Willem Hendrik de Beaufort, claimed that what Grotius had been to the, 18th, to the 17th century and Bankers Hook to the 18th, Asser was to the 19th century. To give some answers on this question, I'd like to review Asser's life in the next, say, 20, 25 minutes. And we start with his ideology. The term itself seems rather pretentious in as much as commentators have often argued that to Asser, theory and doctrine ne meant nothing at all. This holds true for the later part of his work, not quite. For Asser was a precocious youngster and in his formative years, he produced three tracts of various orientation, but from the same philology, from the same uh, perspective, and the same ideology. Asser presented himself emphatically as the child of enlightenment. The first concerned a review of the raison d'etat in France. The second was a stunning award-winning treatise on the economic a concept of value. The third was an overhaul of parliamentary and constitutional history of the Netherlands and of its foreign policies over the past three uh, centuries. And they had all the same in common. The key words were liberalism, free markets, and the concept of progress. Now this in itself is nothing astonishing given the time frame, but the interesting thing is, and perhaps this is typical of all these precocious youngsters, he never changed his tenets, even when 30 years later the uh, saturated markets invited keen competition to show some of the less kind elements of capitalism and liberalism. Those were the days when Darwin and Spencer with reference to the survival of the fittest, to the improvement of the species, justified this policy. But meanwhile, politicians turned towards protectionism, nationalism, and even doctrine changed its mind, and most private international lawyers called it a day. Uh, Kahn in Germany, uh, Dicey, Albert Dicey in England, and Kosters in the Netherlands. Another interesting thing is that Asser came with these views against the background of a very conservative and isolated Dutch Commonwealth. It was a nation that still bemoaned its once glorious past and felt wounded by the French occupation then Belgian separation and was enwrapped in its cocoon of strict neutral neutralism and very shy and averse of engaging international commitments. The most interesting thing and the most rewarding thing Asser did in his 40 years of legal advisorship to the foreign ministry was to try and reform the Netherlands and bring it in gear in line with modern democracies. Trying to reform the department of the Ministre Fénéon and trying to improve on the overall stature of our embassies and delegations. Mm -hmm. Nothing much happened in 40 years. But the fact is that in modern times, few foreign ministers will have availed themselves of the analytical uh, genius of a man like Asser, who managed to disentangle the legal, political, and economic perspective of any given issue without hesitation, much, in much, on much occasions, not too much avail. And I must say that if anything I could recommend to scholars, young scholars, is to review his files as the uh, legal advisor for the uh, foreign ministry. Also, in many respects, didn't belong in his world at home. He was a social maverick, and I come up with two 
aspects to prove it. First of all, he was the one who, to the astonishment of foreign commentators, had a solitary crusade to abolish that atavism of corporal punishment, and especially the criminal regime for the youngsters. It's interesting because that is one of the steady uh, ingredients of his Conférence d'Alleia. And as a matter of fact, his second gifted son was the pioneer of the Dutch Association for the Protection of Minors. So there's a wonderful tradition there. And there's another aspect. In the 1880s, Asser was involved in the reform of constitution. And at stake was suffrage and education. What Asser did is first combine the two and then maintain, and he had a solitary stand in that respect as well, that one should substitute the prevailing criterion of capital and property with a new criterion which he called capacity, meaning intellect and education. And through the compulsory education for male and female in a gradual process come to general suffrage. He was dismissed as a socialist. It lasted till 1919 when his visionary views were finally implemented in legislation exactly a century ago. So where did he get his inspiration, if he didn't get it at home? The Asser family came in the 17th century from the Berlin area, the Spreewald area. And through marriage, and in many accounts, they kept in regular touch with the cosmopolitan views in the Berlin area, with the Jewish Enlightenment, the Haskalah of Moses Mendelssohn. And that was one very important ingredient. There was something else. His great-grandfather, Moses Salomon, even before 1800, had founded a thriving law firm, a firm specialized in international maritime and insurance law. And this was a firm that went through six generations before it merged and merged into what nowadays proudly calls itself Nauta Dutil. That again, is a long tradition. And it tells us that Asar was very much involved in international maritime and transporting. As a matter of fact, at the age of 24, he was, by circumstance, catapulted into the first, inter first Dutch chair of the law of commerce in Amsterdam. It was an interesting assignment because the autonomy of the law of commerce with respect to civil law was the major debate in the Dutch Association of Jurists, the Nederlandse Juristenvereniging, for something like three quarters of that century. Apart from that, commerce was dismissed as morally abject, and the status of merchants was very much questioned in a nation which had, through the VOC, become a seafaring merchant nation. What also, in an impressive, programmatic inaugural address in 62 addressed, is that the sublimation of the law was in keeping the pulse of society and giving answer to the needs and imperatives of society. To the Netherlands, nothing was more vital than commerce and trade. And this held notably in his hometown, Amsterdam. What he did is call up the nation, that nation that was apathic, lethargic, to retake, rekindle their former interest in international life in the days of confrontation and guide the nations towards the age of solidarity, which we find reflected in the windows of the great court, of, great court hall of justice here. He reformed training, started with moot courts, introduced merchant class students to his studium generale. And more than that, 
He practiced the law. What he did is combine his, to the bewilderment and actually ridicule of colleagues, he combined his chair with a practitionership in his law firm. And when, 25 years later, new academic regulations forbade that combination, he didn't give up his practitionership, but withdrew to an extraordinary to still being able to combine the two. To answer, trade and transport were his bread and butter. He was, whether it was by rail, road or river, he was most proud of having pioneered the Berne Conventions in the 1890s, the Berne Conventions on the Carriage of Trade by Rail. He was the first to pioneer the abol abol abolishing of Rhine tolls. He gave legal advice to the ministry on Rhine, on Danube, on Scheldt, on Wester Ems. He represented the Netherlands at the, conference in Kong, at the conference in Berlin on the Congo River and in Paris on the Suez Canal. And later on, he settled a dispute for his government, the dispute with France and England in the Guineas, the boundary rivers in the Guineas and Suriname. It never stopped with him. For 25 years, he was a founding father and inspiring member of Auguste Bernard and Louis Franck's Comité Maritime International. It was only natural that Arthur would turn abroad. What was more remarkable is that 25 years later, he came back and in his trail brought that oiled machinery of Institut, an international law association, to turn a recalcitrant nation and a dowsy provincial township into the hub of international life. In 1898, when he chaired the Jubilee session of the Institute in The Hague, he claimed that it had all begun in 1862, 25 years earlier, when he first went to see the uh, first meeting of uh, Auguste Couvreur's Association for the Reform of the Social Scientists. Here he met kindred souls. Here he came up with ideas for the execution of foreign judgment, for uh, bills of exchange, and for new rules for uh, uh, companies, company law. Here he met John Westlake and Gustave Ronin, and the three closed a friendship for life. Couvreur's association, association went down within a couple of years, but Asa kept in touch with his colleagues, and three years later, he initiated with his two friends the first international law journal, the Revue. They managed to create an international network of internationalists, even survived the onslaught of the Franco-Prussian War. And when, after that war, with the Alabama arbitration in 1872, a first bleak sun peeped through the clouds of war, the propagators of progress turned to this triumvirate to implement two new associations to implement the Institut de Droit International, and a couple of weeks later, a couple of miles down the road, the International Law Association in Brussels. They were rivaling and competing and complementary institutions. And in 1875, they had a frontal clash in The Hague of all places. But over the past 150 years, the two associations in their complementary roles have been of infinite value to the development and codification of our discipline, of course. And it's interesting that tonight is co-sponsored by the NC2 and the Dutch affiliation of the International Law Association. What is it that Arthur brought to bear in his contacts with the members of the NC2 
en de mama of de dingen. Asa claimed to be a man of peace. He claimed to be the great pacificator, harmonizer, conciliator. But deep down burned Vulcan Smithy. It has been said of Asa that the suggestion of rush and haste clung to his every move, his every gesture, his every glance. And it's interesting to see that he was not the kindest of teachers to less gifted pupils. That he was a dominant and demand, domineering and demanding father to his gifted sons. And in his files we find at least four documents in which he, from injured pride, uh, from injured pride offered his recognition to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, then to hastily withdraw, probably at the wise suggestion of his wife. But all this can be easily condoned by us, that is. For there were two aspects of his character <coughs> which were all decisive to our discipline. The first for his time, the second for our times. Asa was perhaps the most flexible, the most resourceful and the most creative of lawyers of his time. Whenever a deadlock appeared or threatened, they called him in. And he found a solution by contraptions, by tricks, by winning time, by things that were not appreciated by all of his colleagues. And he was nicknamed Vucius reborn, the Dutch law that in the, through the paralegal uh, contraption, one may say, of comitas uh, tried to improve on the law in the 18th uh, century. There are many moments when he made a difference, and especially at the Hague Conference, of course, when he came up with that trivia of Ranva to find a solution for the deadlock of domicile and nationality. In 1910, when he was almost at the end of his line, he came up with another trivia of uh, inverted ratification process to help out the exec executive committee of the uh, Opium Conference at a loss how to solve that riddle. But most importantly, he was the genius of organization. He went to Brussels in 1862, but brought 300 delegates back to the Amsterdam in 64. He started the Institute in 1873. He brought them to The Hague in 1875. He started his project for an international conference of private, private international law in 1874. It never materialized. Neither did it in 81 or in 88. But in 91, he tried again. And in a political quid pro quo with the prime minister, he managed to realize his dream. In 1898, at The Hague, the Institute amply discussed arbitration and disarmament issues. And on the day their session was adjourned in St. Petersburg, the Tsar proclaimed his rescript. Three months later, at a loss how to find a venue to host the conference and to come up with a proper agenda the ministry in St. Petersburg turned to Theodore Martins. And Martins knew all along what to do. He twittered Asser and made sure that in a matter of weeks, all that for the venue was arranged. He relied on Asser's personal intervention more than on the traditions of Geneva and Brussels. To that extent, the Conférence de la Haye Le projet de longue haleine, as it was called, was also the birth ground and the cradle of L'Oeuvre de la Haye. And to that extent, Asa may count as the founder of the Hague legal tradition. But he would never have made any headway 
if not for his colleagues at the Institute, if not for the solidarity among them and the way they inspired each other and the way they informed each other better than any foreign ministry was informed, especially in The Hague, about what was going on and the Lega Lata and the Lega Ferranda. In 1893, five minutes? Yeah. In 1893, uh, in 1893, uh, he had prepared everything for 30 years for the Hague Conference. But the point was that his principle to start questioning general principles never made any headway. And it was thanks to the intervention of Louis Renault, his crony, that the conference was not nipped in the bud. And the same helped for so many projects. The members of the Institute were all over the place at the Hague Peace Conference. They chaired the commissions. It was only thanks to their solidarity and fraternity within the Comité d'Examen that the Hague Convention on Arbitration ever was pushed through. It was the same with the building of the Peace Palace. It was Martens who first consulted Carnegie and came up with sponsorship for a courthouse and library. It was Asser who was at the root of the library. And in 1910, when he was celebrated for the fifth anniversary of his epical dissertation, he suggested the creation of a fund for a first ever public library of international law. And in 1912 made sure that his crony, uh, that his crony, Roland, uh, Albery Rollin, became the first librarian of the court and the first secretary general of the institute. It went on like that forever. Over the past 100 years, 50 members of the institute have been involved in 140 cases before the PCA. 64 of them were members of the International Court of Justice. Well over 300 produced more than 900 courses at the Hague Academy. As I said elsewhere, they built themselves a city of peace in the Hague. I will conclude by returning to the Beaufort. To us, the law was a living force. It signs not an artful doctrinal system, but a coherent collection of rules and precepts meant to have equity and morality govern human relations and monitor men's material interests. It was the task of the law to keep the pulse of society. It was exactly what Vultius did 200 years ago before with his concept of comitas. Asa dreamed the ideal, but he lived the feasible. He was a man on a mission, but by far the tiniest and slenderest of delegates at any international meeting. He made sure to keep his eyes close, his ears close to the ground. Thank you. In the Netherlands, we are proud of Grotius, but I think we can also be very proud of Tobias Asser three centuries later. If you take into consideration his era, what was at stake in his days, what his party is at stake again, and you then listen to Arthur and he mentions words, or maybe I had my own, he's a pioneer the man had courage, the man had energy. He was a great organizer. You called him a genius in organizing, but also in other ways, I think. A man who combined theory and practice, a man who was daring to transcend legal discipline and to also look at uh, foreign affairs and at economic issues. And that, all that in that time and now brought together in 25 minutes only 
by this great man, so thank you very, very much. Later on, um, you will also be able to ask some questions to Arthur, should you want to know something in more detail. I think he will participate at the panel. And for now, it's a very special moment. It's my privilege to ask Dan Osser, great-grandson of Tobias Osser, to come forward and to receive the Manium Opus written by Arthur Eifinger. And we, in academia, we sometimes use the word Magnum Opus, but this is a real one. I don't know how many kilos, Arthur, but it's absolutely uh, magnificent, literally, and most likely also content-wise. Dan, may I ask you to come forward? Arthur, you seem to know where the book is. Yeah, I see. <laughs> Willem Daniel Hendrik Asser, do you accept in your able hands the rich and rather heavy legacy of your great-grandfather's works in sacred trust. I will, thank you. <laughs> there is, if I may, there is just one thing I would like to, to suggest. I would suggest all members of the Asser family to rise now and ask you all for a big hand in appreciation of this family that to eight generation and going has so much enriched the world of the law, national and international. If you please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The content, but feel free to use them the way you like. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, uh, I've been asked, well, I'm, of course, in the first place, very proud to be here and to have been the first to receive this enormous magnum opus by um, Arthur Effinger. Um, we know Arthur Eifinger for a couple of years now, and we became friends, also with Luce, of course, and uh, we were there when this, well, this book was coming, well, to an end, but it took a couple of, quite a couple of years to reach that stadium. But uh, we know how difficult it was to write this to collect all the information and how hard Arthur had to work on it. And that's, this is the result. And it's amazing that you can write so many pages about somebody who is, has died more than a century ago and who has only been remained in memory by street names in our country except for the lawyers among us. And it's, I, I'd like to say something about to be an asset, but first I would like to thank you for being the family biographer, because it's not only about um, uh, uh, Toby, Tobias Asser, Toby as he was called by his family, mem members of the family and, and friends, and, but it's also about the family, the origins of the family, and then you can immediately understand what the kind of family we are. Um, I won't go into that at this moment. But really, Arthur, you are amazing that you can write s such, s such vol volumes about one person and the, uh, the, 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 well, I would say, um, the, the family up to, uh, until um, uh, his sons. Thing. Yes, my, grand, my grandfather. Um, I recognized a lot in it, and we have discussed several topics in it um, during uh, the process of um, making, writing this book. And um, I, 
I'd like to say, I am an esser, and how is it to be an esser? Terrible. Especially when you are young and you come to Leiden and start your studies and they expect you to get only a 10 for every. But I, I failed many exams in Leiden because I wasn't interested in, the, in, 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 in law in, in the beginning. But then I had so many other things to do in, in, in you, as you, when you are young and you want to study law. Then you say, well, law, you start studying, uh, the, the, preparing the exams two months before, and then the rest of the year you can do other things. But I did, but I failed. But you didn't fail at all. It's very basic. I, I cannot understand this. I wouldn't be able to do that, but it's, I'm here to praise you, and that's dangerous, as you know, as a classical um, when they come to, um, with, uh, with uh, presents and, 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 and praise you, hmm? they're going to bury you. But I'm not, I'm going to praise you because it is amazing what you did and it's a great work. But um, it's also great because it, it makes clear what law means and how it, how it comes to exist in existence. And um, you can see that in the mind and works of this man, my great-grandfather. Um, to be an essay is terrible, I said, and uh, I think um, uh, it's terrible also because you uh, are born into a family in which discussions at the, at the table when we have had dinner every night were, were also terrible. Because one, somebody started the discussion and then we had my two elder, elder brothers and my father and my mother and I, and we never agreed upon, upon anything. And then uh, heated debates were, uh, well, were there at the table. And uh, it also always ended that my father said, well, I'm elder than you and I know how it is, so um, let's uh, stop discussion. That's what asses are. Um, but uh, I have to see what. Oh, no, it gaat niet goed. That's what <laughs> my daughter think um, came with. I can't keep calm. I'm an asser. That's the reason why asses are not calm. And Toby wasn't calm at all. I think. Uh, so you explain that in your book. You have you need these volumes to. Explain to explain and prove that he was not a calm man. He must have been, he has had an enormous drive. And that's what I recognize in myself also. You can't keep calm because you are an ass. Um, here he is, and he looks very calm. But if you could look into his brains, you would, you would discover that it's all turmoil. But organized turmoil, and I recognize because my brains are also very unorganized turmoil, but uh, sometimes you have to organize it to, to just to write something or to say something. But you see, um, in the eyes, how he is. He is not quiet there. He's not calm. You can see in his eyes that he is looking and thinking already about the next treaty he is going to uh, uh, make. And here is his house, where he, his last house, I think, where he lived in the, in the Hague. And it looks very calm. But I'm sure that in this house, not only the brains, but, only, but also his whole being there was not calm at all. He forbade the piano teacher to have a glass of water. He said, here, a piano teacher wants a glass of water. No, there is no water in this house to drink when you are thirsty. That's a story about my great-grandfather great told you that my father told me. Um, now, guess who's here to congratulate his good old friend, Arthur, um, Arthur, um, we have a present for you. And I, I'd like to ask, 
You did such an enormous work and such valuable work for the family, and you are such a kind and friendly man. And we like you so much that we thought we must do something new on Esser. It's impossible you write this book and there's nothing new. But there is now something complete new which was made of Tobias Esser. And I give it to you, and you may open this. Can you show it? Yeah. yeah. Can you come here? <laughs> and here we have what I think. It's... Okay. It's made by Guus van Eck, and you know he's, he's a painter, he has painted many, many gouaches uh, of The Hague. And we asked him to make a portrait of Tobias Asser. Well, he didn't know the man, so I had to instruct him on uh, Tobias Asser, and he, we sent him photographs, and especially that photo where, which uh, you had, where, which we um, was... Um, was uh, there um, before this one, the, the photograph of Tobias. And um, so we had that made. It's, it's in the, the real thing is like this. But we have made print for you, and this is our present to you to thank you for all the work you did. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> If you see his right eye, it's a bit, but that's the eye, which is the sharp eye of it's Tobias Asser. Yeah. And of course, it is exaggerated because Guus van Eck does that, that is his style. But um, that's the eye which saw everything, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. These are wonderful words on the part of someone who himself made a wonderful career in law in the Netherlands as a member of the Supreme Court, as a professor at almost any university the Netherlands can boast. And this is not the first token of his generosity. I can say that in spite of all the help I got from all my friends and relatives and from all the institutions here, notably the Jewish Museum in Amsterdam, the help of my daughter, the, my wife, to whom, in self-defense, I dedicated these volumes. Nothing would have come about if not for the generosity and the creativity of this man who at some stage said, it would be better if I would bring all these private and families file together and transfer it for digitalization and research to the Jewish Museum in Amsterdam. I wish, project. so I wish many other families would do the same. And Jean Saumon would be the first to agree with me. This is how it all came about. And this is the man who made it possible. Right. So, <laughs> TMC is coming home again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dan. This is clearly about much more than uh, colleagues only, as you can see. I now invite Hans van Loon, former Secretary General to the a Conference on Private International Law, I think Hans for 17 years. <laughs> May I ask you to come forward? He will introduce the panel members and lead the panel itself. Hans, the floor is yours. Arthur, you're also invited to come back. Jean, please come forward. Sit here. Hier en ik ga hier zitten. Janne hier en niet daar. 
Et notre cher Jean... Ah, ben, voilà. Trois, mais ça va Vous mettez là, ça va Quoi So, welcome to our panel, um, dear members of the uh, Asa family, the fourth and fifth generation. Um, wonderful that you're here. We are really very honored by your presence. Dear members of the ASSOS law firm, the continuation of it, that is, and out of duty, thank you so much for your kind uh, reception that you offered. Um, dear members, I should say fellow members of the Royal Netherlands Society of International Law, which has been generous, very generous, in supporting uh, our institute's uh, meeting. Um, cher concert, cher confrère, we've had just had the immense privilege of listening to an amazing introduction to uh, Tobias Asser and his world by the person who more than anyone else in, on this planet, I would say, has dived into the life and work of, uh, of Asser. Um, I think you know Asser better than perhaps than he may have known himself. Thank you so much, Arthur, for a brilliant presentation, which is a very good start, the best possible start, I would say, for our panel. So first let me present our other panel members. Professor Janne Neumann, Professor of History and Theory of International Law, in that order, um, at the University of Amsterdam, and a member of the board and academic coordinator of the institute here in The Hague that bears the name of Tobias, Tobias Asser, the famous Asser Institute. Next to Jane is Marta, Marta Petigas. Marta and I were colleagues at the a conference, but she is now a professor of private international law and transnational international law, which was beyond private international law, perhaps, at Maastricht, and professor of law in Antwerp. So she's a transnational professor in her, herself. And then, of course, Professor Jean Salmon, our very much respected honorary member of the Institute, Emeritus Professor at the University, Université Libre de Bruxelles. An exceptional man, these are Asser's words, not about himself, but about Grotius, whose prison from which he managed to escape so skillfully, uh, uh, the Louvestein Castle we visited, many of us visited yesterday. And thus begins Asser's short biography on uh, Grotius. Asser wrote it on the occasion of uh, Grotius' uh, 300th birthday anniversary in April 1883. And you know, sometimes biographical sketches say as much about the person described as about the author. Of course, we read in the article about uh, Grotius being a child prodigy who started writing poems in Latin at the age of eight, um, went to university when he was 11, became a practicing lawyer when he was 16 years old. We read about the famous scholarly work, of course, the Euro Bellagogue Marcus, Mare Librum, which, as Asser wrote, gave a scientific basis to international law. But what Asser admires most is that Grotius' genius created something new that really worked in practice. It was very essential. And that he did so informed not just by his immense scholarly learning, but also by his life experience. Because the beautiful thing, Asa notes, is, and I quote, that the justice done to Grotius had not embittered him. On the contrary, filled with a warm love for mankind, he managed to use all his talents to promote the maintenance of law and humanity in peace and war, end of quote. He did so through his scholarly work, of course, but also through action. Um, as he, and you might perhaps add, in the footsteps of Erasmus, 
I quote Usser again, repeatedly urged his fellow countrymen, blinded by religious zeal, to be tolerant and reconciling at a time when this could not be done without personal risk. And therefore, Asa writes, it's not only sweet, but also uplifting to honor such a man. Now, I think that what transpires here is Asa's own high moral stance, which is also reflected in his life motto, avec patience et courage. Asa had ideals, but he was not blinded by them. He, turned, he aimed to turn the ideals into practice. And that also explains perhaps the, um, what you mentioned, the stunning ease with which on day one of the first uh, negotiation, on the, uh, of the first meeting of the A conference, he accepted that his whole methodological concept of uh, general principles of international law was swept away immediately by his friend Renaud because he, he sensed that there was no future for his method, method and that one had to proceed step by step, as indeed has been since then the practice of the A conference. Asser had his ideals, but underlying them, inspiring them, I believe, just as he wrote about Grotius, was a high moral consciousness grounded in a warm love for humanity. Now, we have agreed, the four of us, five of us, that on, on three topics, three relationships that we would like to discuss, if we have time. First as a panel, but then also with you. The first theme has to do with the relationship between internationalism and nationalism, in Asa's days and today. The second with the relationship between international law, public and private, and trade and commerce with the economic sphere. And the third, if we have time, concerns the relationship between private and public international law, back in Asa's days and in, in, uh, in our own. Now, our first theme relates then to the parallel that one can see in the international climate as it developed during Asa's lifetime and as it is developing today. And we've touched on that already a little bit on, uh, on Tuesday during the panel. Asa began his work with full confidence in the esprit d'internationalité. Yes, he was aware of nationalistic tendencies, but he believed that that would be possible to overcome them. But then, shortly after his first years, the nationalistic tendencies began to gain momentum. But also supported by his circle of supporters, his international network of friends, remained a staunch and tireless defender of the spirit of internationality and the idea of an international world society. And he used all his talents and energy, in Arthur's words, to give international law a definite foothold in society. Now, in our days, until recently, the ideas of international cooperation, of the international community, of multilateralism were mainstream. But more recently, we are witnessing rising inward-looking tendencies, increasing signs of nationalism, weakening of international cooperation, questioning of international organization. So, what is it that explains this shift? How deep does it go? What are the differences in the relationship between internationalism and nationalism today and in Asa's times? And foremost, what is the role of us as international lawyers, public and private, in this development? And what is the role of learned societies, such as the Institut and the International Law Association? Is Asa his vision, his moral conviction, his moral impetus, his method of working, his flexibility, combined with rigor, is that, uh, can it also be a role model for our times? Are we innovative enough? Are we vocal enough? Or are we complicit, as Rosalind Higgins mentioned on Tuesday, complicit in a erosion of international, in a degradation of international law, international vocabulary even? Jana, may I invite you to comment on Thank you, first thank question. you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the kind invitation. Obviously, it's a great honor to, to be in your presence. Um, and allow me to join in uh, the compliments uh, uh, towards Arthur. I mean, we have seen throughout the years Arthur working on, uh, on these incredible volumes. I mean, 
um, and always bubbling with enthusiasm and new anecdotes. So um, really something to look forward to. And that now the volumes are there and we'll surely follow up also at the Institute with, with some con um, continuation of, of discussions of Toby Zasser's work. Such an impressive figure. Um, a role model, well, you know, there's this wonderful phrase uh, by the Cambridge historian Quentin Skinner that says, yeah, we'll have to do our thinking for ourselves. Um, there, there is not uh, much space for crude lessons when you go to history. Um, we do history to really also um, escape the spell of our le intellectual legacy, right? It's, it's, it's both. You want to be uh, learning from how did we get to where we are now, but also be careful um, and learn from what was missed, the, what, what was over, overlooked. So in that sense, uh, uh, when we read Tobias Asser coming from, from public international law, in my case, um, there is a lot to, to, to learn. Uh, in the first place also about ourselves, obviously what, what, what history, doing history and, and working on, on legal history does. Now, you come with two questions basically. Um, what, what's happening with this shift from internationalism back to inward looking nationalist attitudes to the world and to multilateralism and, and to what extent can Tobias Asser and his work in his times help us reflect on these issues and obviously this man uh, is in incredible uh, with his um, uh, rich life and he, it's, it's true I, I paused a moment when Arthur you talked about ideology um, I, I, it, it, it's quite a, a loaded uh, word but in any case he did have a vision and you see it particularly uh, in his uh, 1862 um, uh, uh, inaugural address at the University of Amsterdam and, and our colleague uh, uh, Ernst Hirsch Balin has, has republished that lecture yeah. and yeah. Uh, rightly points to a particular sentence there about indeed the, the relationship between uh, society and law and the idea that law should support trust, be conducive to trust in society, to trusting uh, relationships and I think there you could say there is interesting a link to explore with Grotius. I won't go into that now, but since you mentioned Grotius. Um, and that's uh, uh, an interesting thought, right? Uh, and, and we took some inspiration from that uh, with our research uh, program. Now, if you then think about his um, Farwell address, you, I'm afraid you see a different tone, right? He reflects on the optimism of his 1862 address and, yeah. and uh, he, he, is, yeah. he is much more somber. Uh, whoops. Um, and if you then start to think about uh, uh, our times, uh, and, and I'm going to be a bit short now and maybe there is, uh, uh, there is an, a possibility later to return to it because obviously... Um, but to what extent have all these incredible institutions that some of which have been part of his, uh, he gave birth to those institutions with his thinking, with, with the institute, with uh, his energy, uh, the PCA, but also other institutions. To what extent have we catered well to them, right? Have we looked to society well enough to make these institutions uh, um, still and, and, and uh, trust, the trustworthy institutions that, that they need to be? Um, and and do, we, do we need to reform them? And obviously then I, then I remember a lecture here in this room in November by, by one of your members saying, well, uh, reform institutions, it's, it's difficult. And, and uh, we've tried it so many times and public trust has not really uh, responded well to it, but, but what I do learn uh, from, from uh, Asa's biography, or at least I hope to see how he was doing things, um, but the incredible energy and the idea to work towards institutions from scratch. I mean, there wasn't a permanent court of arbitration. Can you imagine? I mean, we have now an institution, uh, we have now investment arbitration, their problems, 
maybe we, we, we can address them with that same hands-on uh, imaginary. Um, and uh, that's something that is quite, quite inspiring, I find. The idea that, that this man was capable to imagine institutes that contributed uh, not immediately. There was the First World War. His whole legacy collapsed in a way. And yet, in the long run, um, there, th these institutions turn to be extremely relevant and are extremely relevant today. So that uh, um, uh, uh, is something of a, of a responsibility mm -hmm. to, to on, and yeah. on that note. Um, to, to ask ourselves to what extent we, we, we can improve even um, the institutions of today. And then I think particularly uh, where it comes to social justice and, and, and where we produce and reproduce inequality rather than equality. And I'm sure maybe we will um, um, discuss that uh, also in, in, uh, in our next no, round. No, certainly. Maida? Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. Can I add my words of thanks uh, to, the, to the two institutions that are co-organizing this uh, evening? Also my words of admiration for the tremendous work that you carried out. Uh, and indeed, we all share uh, this passion and, 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 uh, uh, for, for the figure of uh, Tobias Asser. Um, coming to your question, Hans, um, yes, I think there are parallelisms to be made. Uh, L'histoire se répète. And uh, I think we are indeed, again, in terms of uh, decaying multilateralism, and you asked us what is our role, what is the role of uh, institutions like the ones uh, represented here today. Um, I see different uh, avenues. We are all uh, like-minded in a way because I think we are all very much passionate by international law. And, and somehow the, the first uh, thing that uh, I think comes to mind is that, of course, it's easy to uh, talk uh, to the converted, to uh, preach to the choir. And you are the choir, you are the converted. Uh, and uh, in, in that sense, I think what I, I would like to say is that, of course, uh, what is expected from us in whatever capacity is to go beyond those um, circles of uh, trusted, uh, like-minded uh, people. Because um, I think that um, in this particular setting, um, most of us will share uh, the same thoughts of preoccupation for this decaying multilateralism and this uh, reversion back to nationalism. Um, but um, we have to go beyond that preoccupation. Uh, how can we do that? I, have, I, I would like just to, to put a few ideas on the table and very much depends a bit of uh, what hat uh, you, you're wearing uh, today and in your daily life. Um, I think on the one hand, for those of us who have uh, uh, academic positions, um, we, we are in a very lucky position. We are surrounded by young people who come to us uh, without uh, a very firm mindset, who are willing to learn from us about uh, um, the impact of international law in uh, their daily practice later on. Uh, they, are the futures, they are the future lawyers. And uh, from that perspective, I think that there is a very important role to carry out uh, in those universities, not only for the next generations, but also if I can see um, what's happening in, in the faculties these days, it's also about, um, well, expressing that importance and relevance of, of our mm -hmm. discipline or disciplines. We come back to private versus public uh, later on. Um, in, uh, with our colleagues, and uh, because uh, obviously, um, again, we are the converted, we are the ones who are very much aware and understand the importance and the relevance of uh, international law, but uh, we are the minority, right? And so from that perspective, I think there is a lot of work to be done um, in, in those settings. I was also thinking, um, about the work of uh, intergovernmental organizations. Jana, you already uh, referred to some of, of them. And um, there also I would like perhaps to add a few words based on, on, on an experience, my, my personal experience at the Hague Conference. I was struck uh, somehow uh, there, and maybe it applies to other organizations, 
um, that you know we, we, we took many uh, issues for granted. We thought that it was uh, only ma uh, normal that uh, states would support uh, whatever initiative we would put on the table, and uh, any any idea we thought was was good for the progress of the organization. And certainly we had good ideas. We have good ideas, um, but uh, we cannot take it for granted, right? Like any other uh, person and uh, or or uh, institution in this society. We have to, uh, I think, uh, um, justify our role in, uh, in, in, in that society, in, in that organization, in that world. And so I think I would like to recommend uh, to uh, those who are uh, involved in, in that kind of work to uh, well, act with uh, some uh, level of, of um, humbleness, uh, I think as the one that characterized uh, Asher as well, pragmatism, that is also something that really resonates with me because I think uh, by keeping uh, your uh, feet on the ground, you are able to accomplish uh, much more. So I would leave it at that for now. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but if you, you feel like uh, saying a few words, uh, you're more than welcome, of course. But if you prefer that... Uh, I, came, I came with... Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's with, okay. Uh, yeah. About Très bien. Go for it. No, no, let... let, let to be at the end, that's okay. That's at fine. The end? Yeah, that's fine. That's As right. we agree, that's fine. Would you yes, want to I have a word? Right? Yeah. May I respond oh, oh, briefly sure, sure, to, to what, uh, for the sake of uh, creating some debate? Um, I'm not so sure that the analysis is correct that, um, I'm not sure you're suggesting it, but just let's uh, see it, it, that the current citizen is, is going away from the esprit d'internationalité in the sense that, that there are no expectations. I, I, I'm afraid that what we're seeing with the backlash is not a sense of take back control in the sense that it's, um, we don't want things to be arranged at the international level. Um, I, I tend to interpret the, the cry of indignation differently and, and as a profound a disappointment um, in, in, in a global economy kind of uh, uh, situation that is not regulate, uh, regulated. Uh, uh, please do create a, a, a legal order also at the international level, at the, at the global level. Um, and that, that disappointment, to me, to some extent, is also a positive emotion. I mean, the realization that in a world that has globalized, some authority is necessary at the international global level, and maybe it is, there's more needed than what a, a regular citizen sees, to me seems to be actually something positive. Um, uh, and something we can work with. And then I very much underscore what you were just saying, Mata, the fact that, that it requires us, as, and then again, it's preaching to the converted. Obviously, we're all here in, in here together, um, but to share uh, in this, in this uh, vision that law can cater to these needs. Um, so a bit more optimistic, maybe in uh, in honor of uh, of Tobias Asser. Um, <laughs> yes, please, Hans. Thank you. Yes, in most terms, I wholly agree and totally agree. Of course, there's just one thing. Uh, on the higher level, there's much we share with Asser's generation, but all in all particulars, it's a completely different ball game. You yourself, Mr. Chairman, has once said with the Hague Conference, we're dealing with moving targets. And that's the thing. Uh, in Asser's day, the, disc the discourse was both more narrow and more wide. On the one hand, there was no such thing as international jurisprudence. There was no such thing as international legislation. It was, came all to the research and reports and resolutions of these research bodies. They meant much more than than nowadays when they are encapsulated in so many other organizations. And it started in 57 when Monsieur Francois, the president of the, uh, of the uh, uh, institute at his session in, in Amsterdam said, we are getting cornered by the ILC. Now this is quite a thing and this is what any uh, 
hard-boiled politician would have acclaimed uh, at the time. So on the one hand, it was narrower. On the other hand, and that is another thing that has changed overnight, both peace conferences were emphatically encouraged by the Interparliamentary Union. The discourse at the time at Alsa was between political economists, political scientists, lawyers, uh, parliamentarians, and even some pacifists. So that changed after the second, uh, the First World War, when each discipline more or less came in its own, when the international course came. It was a narrowing down within a discipline, and I think that changed the discourse too. So, in order to be at the same level and uh, uh, address and tackle the same problems as Asa and his colleagues did in his day, we have to perhaps go back to uh, what is most important to us. One example, when Asa discussed arbitration on the eve of the peace conference in 1899, he said arbitration is a wonderful mechanism but most international disputes at this moment are artificial political disputes, simply meant to justify aggressive policies. At the same time, when the Dutch, in 1907, when the Dutch government proposed to take arbitration out of the equation and out of the agenda of the Second Hague Peace Conference, Asa said, and also was ordered not to speak up, he made his most brilliant speech ever in favor of arbitration. And when he was reprimanded, I said, I resign as Netherlands delegate because I'm on the side of my colleagues of the NCT. And showed character, huh? Um, some provocative compliments have been made, some food for thought. May I invite you to... Are we... Uh... Is, do we share the, our, the, uh, the optimism that uh, Jana expressed? Uh, is there... What, what is your feeling? What can we do? Yeah. Michael? Yeah? It should work. I think we can hear you, Michael. Long way from short question. <laughs> um, I just wonder because um, uh, Astor's uh, Jewish background was mentioned. Uh, I would just wonder whether that background has any impact on his achievement of his work, uh, his career, and so on. That's all. That's a question for you. On the achievement, achievement on his work, his Jewish background. Oh yeah, absolutely. On his work and also on his, I think, in a, on his overall uh, uh, attitude to life, it meant a lot. His family, in the previous three generations, had managed to um, say, being social mavericks like Asa became himself, managed to get uh, uh, suffrage in the Netherlands. Until the French marched in in 1797, only the uh, Protestant, not the Catholics, not the Anabaptists, not the Lutherans, not the Jews, had, and not the Catholics, had any say in official circles and stood any chance to becoming uh, a member of the uh, Noblesse d'Europe and things like that. All that changed. And, but it changed the people too, of course. And it made them very much aware of, uh, uh, of what they meant. But one instance, the uncle, the, the brother of his mother became the first minister of justice Jewish Minister of Justice, first Jewish minister in the Netherlands in the days he grew up, in the days he wrote his thesis. And that meant a breakthrough, as like we had a first female prime minister in the Netherlands and things like that. These are major moments, of course. The first uh, Madame Bastide, the first who ever entered on the bench of the ICJ. So that was one thing. 
and the, the, the other thing is that obviously, even within the institute, there was some network. Uh, Leon Kahn and there were others. There was some network of people who came from the same idea, the same the background. background yeah. And that background was, of course, liberalism, was, of course, internationalism, and was, of course, progress and commerce. So there is a direct impact of his roots to what the world meant to him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Catherine Cassidian. Uh, I have a completely different question. I would like to continue on your theme of internationalism versus nationalism and, and take it perhaps one step different, mm -hmm. which is transnationalism. Um, whether that means anything or not, unfortunately what I have noticed in a lot of writings uh, recently is that a lot of people are just basically changing internationalism into transnationalism without con uh, content. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they mean the same thing. They just call it transnationalism. For me, it's very different. Transnationalism is, is a completely different species. And so I'm, I was reflecting, and of course it's very difficult to ask that question, but I was reflecting on if Asser was living now, mm -hmm. how would he reconcile this transnationalism which is going beyond state, which is going, which is kind of putting state as if they didn't matter anymore, and private organizations being at the forefront of what the global governance is all about right now, and this backlash from states who are saying, wait a minute, we are here and we, we still want to run the world. So I wonder whether in any of the, um, of the work of Asser we could answer that question in a way or start to give like one or two elements that we could uh, help, that could help us thinking about that. It's a very interesting question. Yeah? yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I've been asking myself the question about, uh, you know, the difference uh, for, for a year now that my chair also has this component of transnational law. We can discuss uh, the, the differences. I do see differences indeed. And uh, as, as you pointed out, the fact that uh, private actors, so the private sector, plays such an important role, at least in uh, much of the challenges that our world faces today, for me, this is a, a very important factor because I see a disconnect between the role that they play in some of the challenges um, that we face, you name it, the climate, uh, the violations of human rights, etc. And, and as far as I see it, the role that they play in the development of uh, international law. You said, well, the states want to keep their uh, important role. To me, it seems only natural that if uh, you know, somebody ha claims that protagonism on one side, we have to give them also avenues to sort things out. And I see a lot of self-regulation um, in, in many of the big corporations, for example, that play a role, in particular in the uh, technological sector. Um, and uh, I do believe that this is a, a component of transnational law that flows from the uh, essential role that uh, these uh, new actors play in our world. Whether, whether uh, Asser and, and his legacy can help us with that, I think others are more qualified than me to, to comment. The only thing that really um, that I see in his work is uh, this uh, ability of keeping his feet on the ground and being pragmatic and keeping a close eye about practice. And I think that all these elements can help us very much in whatever capacity we have in making sure that, uh, uh, well, that transnational law develops in a way that is uh, possibly acceptable to, to all players. That's my little contribution. Thank you, Marta. Yeah, to follow up on that, because it's interesting how he started on a chair in commercial law, and when he writes about commerce and trade, 
And obviously, it's the time of industrialization, the corporations are on the rise. He does so always with this eye for the public interest and the common good. So my remark with respect to our institutions and, and also arbitration was also related to he's pragmatic, yes, he has a vision, but there are values there yeah, in that vision. Yeah. And I think that is so incredible to see when he moves from the early days where it's optimistic, there's trust, there it's, it's 1862, there are corporations there, there, there are non-state actors. He was open to that completely, looking as a, as a real lawyer creatively to what was necessary, and then later in life brings that pragmatism, uh, but, but takes the values along. So you really see in his writing the common good, the public interest, and, and uh, the international uh, life, humanity, uh, those kind of values are always there when he develops his ideas. So it's pragmatism and, and that combined. And I can imagine, but this is utter speculation because it's after five and, and you're still here, but I can imagine that he would have that same open a creative spirit today and and also that was why I was saying this this earlier about have we cared enough for the institutions also to be a bit I mean we, we need to discuss things I mean these are important values and uh, and how how are we living up how are we taking care of these values and 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 also that uh, that that is related to what the Dutch are doing in their foreign policy, how how they stepped up. He took them out of isolation, yeah, as as you as you said, um, and their values could also play play a role. But let me let me hand over to whoever wants to. Yeah. 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 Very briefly, a very practical pragmatic approach of us was, of course, that from the first, in the, within the context of the uh, Institut, he advanced Mancini's ideas of private international, which were all centered around the concept of nationality. It was the only viable option at the time. And this is exactly what Asra told 40 years later, when he advanced the idea of domicile, and he said, you have always been advocating nationality. And then he said, yes, well, obviously, it was the only viable option at the time. Now change are, times are, uh, are changing. I saw another question. What's happening? follow what Jana was saying, because it's also striking that they were, he was a man of his time, so he was a lawyer dealing with trade law, with company law, but he also had the sense that there was some publicness that had to be done and achieved, and, uh, and this is, and I, I wanted to draw a parallel and have your sense of, because I've always been amazed by the figure of Gustave Monnier in Geneva, who was also someone who was part of the bourgeois family who was involved in trade matters, yeah. economic matters, but also cared about the public interest. And, uh, and he was one of the founders of the ICRC, and then he was one of the founders of the Institut de Droit International. And um, the question that I have is that these men were living at the time of the Industrial Revolution and the first globalization, because the first globalization happened at that time. Yeah. And it's quite interesting to see that today we are living, we have, we have sort of distinguished this word of company law, trade law, with the notion of public interest. And the question that I would have is, uh, if we were Tobias Asser, or what should we do today to sort of reconcile this idea of trade activities, economic activities, which are necessary for our societies, with the taking care of the public good and the taking care of social order? Laurence, thank you so much. And obviously, this is more your domain than, than mine <laughs> in a number of ways. But I, uh, um, it's, it's exactly what I was hinting at, what I think is, is necessary. And of course, we, we see that 
well, for decades, I mean, since the 1970s, within the UN context, there have been attempts to, to regulate transnational corporations and to bring, to keep different areas of the law together. Um, uh, and that's crucial. One of the things that I follow at the moment, and I guess uh, all of you, is, is the negotiations of the legally binding instrument, uh, the negotiations in Geneva uh, to, to regulate transnational corporations. I know in the Netherlands they have revised their, their uh, investment uh, uh, treaties in the sense that human rights and labor law, uh, sustainable development, these values are really now also in those uh, treaties. So, so I think these kind of developments deserve a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, support. And, and uh, I think that, that those are examples of where our creativity uh, sh should go. Um, obviously, there, there, is, uh, there are others. Uh, I'm sure you want to add, mm. uh, Marta. I could. I, there's there's uh, the one other thing that comes to mind and that I very much admire in, in his work. Uh, besides uh, the pragmatism, I think he was, uh, as was already pointed out, ahead of his time and he dared to launch uh, new ideas, mm -hmm. even though they could, um, they could not fit in, in the society where... where uh, where he then lived. Uh, I think uh, we, we have a, a role and a mission as, as international lawyers to, to keep that uh, in mind. What do I mean more specifically? Uh, in private international law, which is the, the, the area I'm more familiar with, um, some ideas clearly are, are uh, launched uh, uh, much before they can uh, be uh, realized. Um, Hans van Hutter left. Uh, he he was my thesis supervisor, and and uh, you know 20 years ago, uh, I uh, myself uh, it's a frustrating example of my own. I, I submitted some some ideas about international patent enforcement, something that has no uh, uh, big repercussions in the broader sense of of, of international law, uh, and those ideas were categorically. Uh, let's say, denied by uh, Court of Justice and, uh, and uh, of the European, the European Union of uh, Court of Justice. Um, and, and even today, uh, we, well, we still ha don't have an, an international patent uh, court. So this ought to say that um, I think many times we, we, we are cautious and, 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 and try to fit in, 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 in our uh, framework. But what I have learned from ASER, and maybe something that we all have to learn from ASER, is, is, to, is to dare. And indeed, if, if that is in, uh, one, one, uh, one issue where that requires our attention and we're, we're uh, working with uh, you know, respect for, for important values, um, has to uh, play the, the prevailing uh, factor, has to be the prevailing factor, then, then I think we can learn from him also mm -hmm. to, to be ahead of our times. Yeah, just to, uh, to add uh, to this uh, uh, spirit of, uh, more positive spirit of uh, the esprit d'internationalité, uh, to give an example how, uh, how Asa inspired also uh, after the First World War. Uh, the statue of Asa that we see here, this Peace Palace, was revealed in 1921. It was the first uh, meeting of the uh, uh, International Law Association after the Great War, when the German and British and French uh, and other uh, lawyers were meeting again, the outcome of that, uh, that conference was the, the Hague rules on sea transports, which are now the hague Fisby rules, which was in that, those days uh, the first confidence-building measure, we could say. And they were called the Hague rules as a tribute to Asser. So, well, the question would be, of course, that's very technical if Asser was also then uh, inspired, the, the contents of those uh, those rules, those Hague rules. But uh, I think it's an example that uh, uh, as a spirit of uh, esprit d'internationalité survived the First World War and uh, helped to inspire some of the first mm -hmm. treaties that, uh, that were uh, devised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have, I believe, already arrived in, uh, in the middle of our second question, the relationship between the economic sphere and, and international law. Um, I may be wrong, but to my mind, there's a striking contrast between us's days in, in that respect and our days. In us's days, trade and commerce were blossoming, and, and law was seen as an essential instrument to uh, give it shape. All the, the Berne agreements you mentioned, the, the Suez Canal uh, negotiations on the law, and, 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 and trade and commerce went hand in hand. Now, there is still... Uh, 
this relationship, of course, at the Hague Conference, we recently only adopted instruments on choice of court, on uh, principles uh, on, on party autonomy in, in private international law, um, recent uh, judgments convention. That still goes on. There's still outdated things to be removed in order to make trade and commerce possible. But it seems to me that the, there is a, is, a, is a rather striking difference now in that what is, seems to be most needed is that international puts some brakes on uh, an Ill, um, limitless uh, expansion uh, at the cost of, um, of, of, of many common, uh, common values. And that is not an easy matter. I mean, the, the, Rigi, the Ruggie principles uh, defined uh, that, uh, said that uh, companies have a social responsibility for human rights, but it is up to the states to discipline them. That is not enough. Hence, the negotiations are going on to try and make a binding instrument. But is there enough support among us for that? We cannot take that for granted. There are mostly developing countries. The EU is participating a little bit. But I, my feeling is that that should be getting much more emphasis and support from us. Am I wrong? Am I right? <laughs> What's your feeling? I, yeah, uh, yeah, I just uh, mentioned that, that I totally agree with you. It, it's all... Uh, at least, uh, uh, as I said or wrote uh, uh, towards the Netherlands, at least engage. And that relates to that earlier remark that I think a lot of citizens once are eager to understand and see uh, at the international level institutes and norms that regulate. And, and we, we hear situations of corporations saying, well, I'll see you in court, but knowing that no one knows which court and where to go mm -hmm. regarding victims of, of, of human rights or environment uh, pollution. Um, and, and, and so there is no, no other way than, than at least engage. Uh, states should engage, the Netherlands should engage, Europe should, should engage. Um, if only to, to, to work and be serious about developing the international legal order in, an, in, a, in a just uh, manner. And, and there's a wonderful, as some of you know, I, I find the work of Paul Ricoeur very helpful. And he says uh, somewhere very, very uh, aptly, I would say, that, that there is an ethical inclination in humans that they want to live together for and with others in just institutions. And you may think, well, it, um, it's a, a quite uh, idealistic. At the same time, I think that's what Usser also realized. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, he, he wasn't living in the time, and now I'm uh, with social media and tech and, and the e-global village. And, but still, I think he realized it was the first globalization wave, uh, there is a need for just institutions. In, in, uh, and, and to mm -hmm. me, this is one example of what the global econic, economy could benefit from. Yeah. Do you want to add to this? Or? Yeah, I would really like to speak about the book. Of yeah, at the end. Right? At the end, yeah. Or at the end, but I... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So it's the chair. I will leave. <laughs> it's all right. There is no time. Sure. No, no, please. No, look, please, please. I, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm invited at, uh, with the judge. Uh, okay. 25 minutes, so... Uh, okay. Then we will reserve the 13 for another time. Please go ahead. Yes. And, yeah. <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm just... We're not going to send away our honorary member like that, of course. It was not, that, was never, that was never the idea, so please go ahead. Well, I'm sorry for the disturbances. But when I was asked to be asked to be one of the members of 
this panel focused on the personality of Arthur, I was completely terrorized. I knew nothing, almost nothing about Nasser. So my first reply was, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't accept that. But suddenly I received the proofs of the books which the member of the Institut de Droit International have received when they arrived, and they were very surprised, that this one, the Institut de Droit International, Cradle and Creed of the City of Justice and Peace. I look at this book and I saw that it was the story of the members, the, not the Dutch members at the Institut de Droit International. And that is exactly what I wanted the other states, the other members do for their nations. So I look at it. And I must tell you that I was really astonished. I found it, it was a wonderful book. And I took, uh, I wrote to the, organizer, to the organizers and say, I accept to come, provided I, I will speak not of us here, of which I know nothing, but I would like to speak of this book. At the, at the time, it was not a book, it was just prints that he had sent me because we are, to, to a certain extent, old friends. And I want to tell you very shortly what is in this book and the reason why it's important for the Institute of International Law. The book embraces 140 years of history of Dutch involvement in international law, and especially that of 27 or 28 internationalists who became, along the years, members of the Institut. And it relates their role in the development of international law in this city. At first, we are told about a story of a small group of young lawyers. Tobias Asser, 30, 31 years old. Gustave Roland Jacquemin, 34 years old. Westlake, 41 years. The three of them create the first important review of international law, La Revue de Droit International et de Législation Comparée, which is, I can assure you, still now a monument. Four years later, the three of them, more or less with uh, Roland Jacquemin's, I'm sorry, he's Belgian, <laughs> Roland Jacquemin's being the leader, with nine other internationalists of over the, 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 the world. Um, and they create in Ghent, Belgium, to those who know, <laughs> do not know, and uh, they create the Institut de Droit International. After that, um, they will do a lot of things together. Uh, they, um, sorry. I have not lost one page, sorry. I prepared it in English, it's, it's already terrible for me. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Eifinger shows how in the years to follow, they will spread their common aims, which were explained in three worlds by Arthur a few moments ago, uh, which were the, the common aims of the Institute, uh, their ideals, in helping the creation of various institutions. He told you, but perhaps look at it. 
the A Conference on Private International Law, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the Peace Palace, the, its library, the Academy of International Law, and later on, they even participated to the creation of the Permanent Court of, of uh, Justice in The Hague. Uh, one discover here the face often undisclosed of these tireless conquistadores of the Young Institute, disseminating the latter ideology and spirit, which was basically bourgeois, uh, free, free commerce, uh, liberty, uh, democracy, as it, as it was considered at the time, but it was very, very well. Uh, and more than that, these people created the language of international relations, that's to say international law. It is in the Institute and the other uh, institution which I have said, which created the, 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 the l'outil that we use to speak of the world, which is law. It is all language. A second aspect of the book, and this is from a methodological point of view for the historians, is that it relays on the archives of the family Asser. And of, of, you, you can see with the book, another book of, of Arthur, uh, it was a, an, an enormous source because it, it spoke about the relation between the three men, the letters exchanged by, by them. The, the, as a matter of fact, not only for the, 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 their aims, uh, their strategies in, the, in, in international law and in the institute, but also the, the, the family links, uh, which is certainly um, within the, the, all these families were close. They were close, for instance, the Asser were, were close to uh, the clan, what we call the clan Henri Rollin. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, Westlake also, the, the, the letters with Westlake, all this is explained in this book, with, with taken from the archives. Uh, and the, the, uh, with, all the people which are known for the lawyers. Um, Rivier, James Brown Scott, Lair, all these people were linked together. They, they spoke about their families, the births, the marriages, included with discussions about the future of international institutions. With the, with the Second World War, unfortunately, uh, there was no longer uh, Asser, uh, uh, all these letters from Asser, and the mine of, in of information lapsed. But Dr. Eifinger makes a very beneficial usage of the annuaire de l'Institut, and particularly of the inaugural speeches uh, by the president of the Institute to enlighten their hopes or their worries about contemporary events. They were anxious about the contemporary events. There, the people themselves, lesser the Institute. Um, for instance, the speech of Professor Francois at the Amsterdam session in 1957 uh, spoke, uh, he explained um, the problems that he see about the future of international law and the international relation. 
The third aspect of Dr. Eifinger's uh, book is to show the contacts of the Dutch members between themselves, with, with each other. And um, it was not always very amiable uh, relations, but all of us know that. We are all in groups, national groups, and we know all the, the hard problems that might be created from time to time. Uh, and what is also something important which I discovered by uh, reading the book um, is that is the central role of the private international lawyers. They, they, they are more apparent than the public international lawyers. Mm -hmm. And this, I believe, may be explained by several factors. The first is that first, Asser's archives, of course, uh, but also the fact that uh, uh, The Hague became the capital, I can say the capital, of international law by all the institutions I spoke to. The last part of the author's work is devoted to bibliographical notes on each former member of the group, completing that way what had been said for the big, at, the, at, the, at the beginning of the existence of the Institute. Uh, so it makes it a book which is extremely interesting uh, with a, 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 lot, a lot of data for works to be performed and uh, to follow uh, more, more in details what, what these um, other internationalists did. I would not like to conclude these words on Dr. Finger's book without under, underlying the pleasure that one feels in reading this work. So well written, the sensibility with which are portrayed the relations between the three musketeers of international law, the discreet and compassionate manner in which are described the sufferings of them in some tragic moments of their life, the delicacy in which are described the places or the atmosphere of various places in the egg where the heroes of this narrative have worked and lived together. For this book, thank you. Un instant, s'il vous plaît, monsieur le professeur, sans mot. Non. These words mean a lot to me for the simple reason that for me, like so many others of my generation, Professor Samo has been a guiding light to the history of international law. And it's only four or five months ago that in a project at Nanterre in Paris, we first met. And ever since, we have come to terms with each other. And we are young at heart, both of us, and you'll hear more from us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sir Comper, for a magnificent tribute and well-deserved tribute, of course, to uh, Arthur Eifinger. And you've even managed to touch on, to touch on the third theme, the relationship between pi private and public international law, for which I'm afraid we, we will have no time. It's 8 o'clock and we won't keep you too long. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our members of our, our panel. And uh, I hope that we have given you some food for further thought or inspiration for action also. Thank you.